a special welcome to, to Robin and Deirdre. Uh, most of you will know Robin. Dr. Robin Lee is, is a well-known Hermanus personality, but I would like to say um, a few things about him and introduce him properly this morning. Robin was instrumental in setting up U3A in the Overburn in 2003. We were 17 years old. He was the founding chairman, a position he held for many years. He was the chairman when I joined the committee. And from the beginning, he has been a valued and active member of the committee throughout the uh, organization's history. He has spoken to U3A many times and on a variety of topics. Since 2012, he has been secretary of the Amanus History Society. He is also an active member of Wealth Coast Conservation. So many hats he wears. And so today's talk on the history of the Ferncurve Nature Reserve brings together his, his, his history and environmental issues and interests. Deirdre Richards is a long-standing member of U3A and has addressed us on several occasions, usually on literary matters, but she's wearing her botanical hat today. She's the author of a recent history of the Hermanus Botanical Society and will join Robin to respond to questions and comments after the presentation. So welcome, Deirdre. And... Um, uh, over to you, Robin. Before I start on the actual text, there are two things that I would like to say. The first deals with terminology. Uh, obviously, most of the history uh, took place before the Ferncliff Nature Reserve itself was established in 1957. So I should be saying every time, the land that was to become the Ferncliff Nature Reserve, which is very awkward. So I'm just going to use the term Ferncliff Nature Reserve to refer to that part of South Africa and, and the planet, uh, which was named in 1957, uh, regardless of the time period in which I'm talking. The second point is a little challenge to you all. You're all aware of Alfred Hitchcock, the famous filmmaker, uh, films like Psycho and The Birds, and Alfred Hitchcock made a point of appearing in every film he made. He, uh, and people, of course, uh, watched the film carefully to see when he might himself appear. Well, I appear in this presentation, and I challenge you to find me as the presentation goes on. Uh, once you've found me, you can put it on chat uh, unfortunately, I have no digital prize to give you. Okay, now to the substance of the talk. As you'll see, I'm going to deal with the past, present and future of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. And it was in the context of it being necessary to sustain our living landscape and conserve our natural heritage. I'm going to start by giving you a snapshot of the position of the FNR at this time. Uh, it is a, legis leg legally, it is a municipal nature reserve. It was established in 1957 uh, by the Hermanus municipality. It was actually formally opened only in 1965. It now comprises some 1800 hectares including some separately named entities like Hoy Scorpi and the Cliff Path. At the moment, there are more than 80 paths and trails, uh, ranging from wheelchair-friendly uh, near the uh, CBD of the Cliff Path and parts of Hoy Scorpi, and to quite rough and ready in many other parts of the reserve. And access to the FNR is almost entirely unrestricted and free. There are substantial buildings belonging to the Botanical Society, including a hall, a Feinbos nursery, a herbarium, and a research center. So that gives you an idea 
of what we're talking about when we refer to the Fern Curve Nature Reserve. The bodies involved in the management of this area, each of them has a history. First of all, there is the Overstrand Municipality, which has a long history going back under various names until 1902. It's now a professionalized local authority and under pressure to optimize its sources of income. There are also some demands from the provincial administration and there is the national legislation which applies to the FNR. There's an advisory body to the municipality, the Ferncliffe Advisory Board, which itself comprised of representatives of various organizations and experts. And then there are two voluntary membership-based organizations, the Botanical Society and the Cliff Path Management Group. Now, these are full of people who have expertise and experience. So you'll see that there's a, a complex management slash administration structure in place. The relationships with the Overstrand municipality have been somewhat strained since, uh, since 2008. The, um, there are some unresolved major There are some unresolved major issues that still exist. Uh, these are the Hermanus Bypass Road and the Hermanus, the Ferncliffe Management Plan. Uh, these have been ongoing since 2008 and 2017, respectively. In relation to the re uh, relations with the Overstrand Municipality, in late last year, uh, the Botanical Society achieved an interview with the Executive Mayor and the Ward 3 Councillor. And at the moment, there is something of a hiatus around a proposed memorandum of cooperation between the Botanical Society and the municipality. Uh, as of earlier this week, it was a situation in which the Botanical Society had submitted a memorandum of cooperation, but apparently has not yet heard from the municipality on this topic. So that gives you an idea of where we stand. A very large ancient body with, with a lot of various interests involved, with uh, some strained relationships between members and uh, a couple of issues up in the air. I should also mention that the Botanical Society has applied for membership of, of the Botanical Gardens uh, Associations of South Africa, but my understanding is that that is still pending. So there are a number of issues still to be resolved in the immediate future. I'm gonna devote a little time now to talking about the origins of the actual land or ground on which the Amonis the Ferncliff Nature Reserve is situated. Like most of the Earth's surface, it arises from various lava flows occurring from molten matter coming up from the uh, mantle of the Earth, the, sorry, the, the Earth core. And gradually, this matter f uh, was over, overrun for on many occasions by very large rivers, which deposited what became sedimentary rocks in on the surface of the earth. And th these were deposited in layers according to the density of the material in the rivers. And these layers of sedimentary rock, which formed the basis of the landform on which the FNR is, uh, was forced upwards at one point in time uh, by the movement of tectonic plates uh, around the planet. 
These created uh, what are called fold mountains in many parts of the world. Uh, they became called the Cape Fold Mountains insofar as they are relevant to this talk. And as you see, the folds can be at various angles to the surface, uh, some of them in fact at right angles. And these are important in the formation of the soil on which the Ferncliff Nature Reserve is grounded. The, amongst the deposits that were made, some were of more dense and more durable material uh, than, than other lighter deposits. And these were form intrusions or even pillars uh, within the various layers of sedimentary rock and were similarly forced up into vertical positions by the movement of tectonic plates. This is a shot uh, of, of another part of South Africa, but it illustrates the way in which the harder material can be sandwiched between the softer sedimentary rocks and both forced into an upright position. A second major phase in the development of the land on which the FNR is, was the formation of wave cut platforms by wave action and action of water from the rivers, leading to flat areas adjacent to the present coast that we have with mountains or cliffs uh, forming in the background. And the whole of the overstrand is essentially located on one of these wave cut platforms uh, with various protrusions from the flat surface uh, caused by harder rock that was deposited and settled amongst the sedimentary rock. Uh, one of these depositions is Hoy's copy, which is generally accepted to be a deposition of much stronger rocky material, which was not worn away by wave and river action when the wave cut platform was formed and still remains as a, a highlight and landmark of, of our part of the world. The fact that it was once under the sea can be gauged by that even on the highest point of Hoyskopi, it is easy to pick up seashells and other remnants of its period underwater. At a certain point in time, about uh, between 400 million and, uh, and 150 million years ago, the area was uh, basis of uh, vast tropical forests uh, full of plants named gymnosperms, of which you have an artist's impression here. And in due course, these were also uh, embedded in rock and compressed to form the coal and oil and gas deposits, which are seen in other parts of South Africa, but not in our immediate locality. About 140 million years ago, the basic single planet of Gondwana broke up into various planetary formations that we now know. And the Ferncliff Nature Reserve area moved closer to the coast and became susceptible to particular climatic changes that occurred in following years. Uh, it has been a fairly stable area of the planet uh, since then uh, and has not been affected much by tectonic movements, although the one developing on the east coast of Africa may have a long-term effect on our area. So we have there the basic geological components. From the geological components, the actual rock of the fold mountains and deposits brought down by the rivers, uh, various soil types were derived. This was a, a crucial point in the history of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve because the soil that eventually occupied the entire area was very low in nutrients 
and did not retain water very well, which meant that any vegetation on that area had to be adapted to the kind of soil on which it was growing, a low nutrient and not retaining much water. And that is evident from any study of the bot botanical aspects of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. The rainfall patterns uh, over the last 100 million years or so were to establish the pattern of dry summers with southeasterly winds and wet winters with northwesterly winds. And again, the Feinbos vegetation had to adapt to that particular climate. It did so by developing the capacity to retain water, largely in its roots, of course, and also to prevent the transpiration of water from its leaves by developing very narrow leaves, often covered with material which further prevented a loss of water through the leaves. The prevailing winds also determined the disposition of the fern cliff vegetation and plays a large part in the reproduction of many of the species to be found. You see here an artist's impression of the narrow leaves of a particular Feinbos plant. And the, the final element that operated in the formation of the vegetation were fires. Fires were, we believe, largely started by lightning in those prehistoric days, but they were very frequent and would have been devastating if the plant the vegetation had not developed means of adapting itself to the frequency of fires. I don't think it's necessary for me to go into detail of how it did so, but it did so so successfully that not only did it adapt to the fires, but actually incorporated the need for fire into their own reproduction systems. This discovery was only really confirmed in the 20th century, but had been adapted uh, many millions of years earlier by the Feinbos vegetation. Uh, it also benefits from nutrients, nutrients from the ashes which are deposited after the fire. So that by the time that what we call Feinbos emerged, these five elements, the geology, the soil types, the climate, notably the rainfall patterns and the wind patterns, and the prevalence of fire had all interacted to create the unique uh, area known as the uh, Feinbos biome, uh, which is this, the distinguishing characteristic of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. The the best definition I've been able to find in the literature of Feinbos uh, is that given by Richard Cowling in his uh, marvelous book on Feinbos. Uh, Feinbos is a shrubland characterized by four growth forms. Tall protea shrubs with large leaves, known locally as the proteas. Heath-like shrubs, the ericas reed-like plants, the restios, and bulbous herbs, the geophytes. He goes on to say, and this is important, the restios are always present. The presence of restios is the unique distinguishing feature of Feinbos. And anyone walking in the Ferncliff Nature Reserve will naturally uh, take cognizance of the accuracy of that statement. So we've now established how the land itself was formed and how the vegetation on it came into existence. And we begin to approach an area where human awareness of the area 
uh, into the his history of, of our planet. I turn now to giving a brief history of the dimensions of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. From this map, which dates from 1873, you can see that the Ferncliff Nature Reserve outlined in green uh, was part of a number of farms and also bordered at that time by one river. The farms involved were Atticus Kloof on the left of the diagram in green, where lots A and lot C were a portion of both of those lots was incorporated into the reserve. And another farm that was affected in the lower left hand part was the farm right uh, on part of the other part of which is still located in minus heights. Another boundary was the Mosul River and the farm Furchelchat, which had originally been owned by brothers called Walsh, uh, forms a further boundary. So the farms themselves were owned, owned under the law of the Dutch East India Company, and I'll say much something about that in a moment. In my research, I've been able to find a newspaper report of the actual declaration of the establishment of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. This took place in 1957, although the Hermanus News of the 1st of March 1958 uh, records it. 225 Morgan of Crown land has been allocated for the Ferncliff Nature Reserve at Mossel River West, which in town will become an important attraction for visitors. The boundaries are set out by the remainder of Glen Valach, by the Mossel River West Township, and in the west by the remainder of Atakos Kloof. An important name enters history at this point, the name of Duncan McFarlane, who owned Atakos Kloof and also the Mossel River Farm on which Fullcliff, Eastcliff, Westcliff and Northcliff are now located. In other words, it is the basis of the uh, entire town of Hermanus. A more recent map shows a, a wider view of the area. The Ferncliff Nature Reserve is clearly marked there with the boundaries as shown in the earlier map uh, with uh, Fullcliff Farm uh, but uh, on, on the right and the, the mines gain Cook nature reserve oh, sorry uh, further to the right uh, the farming land continued to surround the other areas of the Ferncliff nature reserve the map which I estimate to be about the 1950s uh, does show the township of Ferncliff laid out uh, of Fulcliff laid out uh, and the R43, as it now is, running through the town uh, and other features such as the as Walker Bay and, uh, and the Plain River estuary. Uh, the Botanical Society uh, developed the Mossel River Trail in an area of land which was later made available to the Ferncliff Nature Reserve and at later dates the cliff path area and the Hoyskopi and surrounding areas were also incorporated into the Ferncliff Nature Reserve bringing the present land area as I said to about 1800 square 1800 hectares. This is a view from uh, Fulgachat over a portion of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve and the way to the town itself and Walker Bay. Okay, we've now established the origin of various features and the location of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve in historical terms. The next section moves us on to uh, human beings and the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. The, the first human beings across this area uh, that we are 
recorded historical times uh, were, of course, the Sun people and the Kohen people. Uh, I understand that is now the correct pronunciation of the name that was used to be pronounced Koi. The Sun and the Kohen people moved across this area, being nomadic peoples. And we know from various information sources that both of those peoples were well aware of the nature of Feinbos and were well aware of its medicinal and herbal qualities, which could be, which were utilized extensively by both of them. We're now taking something of a leap uh, forward into the 18th century, when one of the very earliest written records of the vegetation of the Fainturf Nature Reserve uh, would, was taken by Lady Anne Barnard in her diary in 1795. She writes, quantities of the most brilliant everlasting flowers, pink with black hearts, grew amongst the heath. The party loaded themselves with them. We were so intoxicated with their beauty, glistening as they did in the sun, like the brightest foils. Although we knew the impossibility for us for them to take, make the journey to, and return to us to England in any tolerable state. Now, obviously, Lady Anne was very knowledgeable in many areas, but botany was not one of them. The everlastings that they picked were which of this variety, would easily have outlasted the return trip to England. So although she was observant of their beauty, uh, she had no real knowledge of the botanical prop properties. When Amanus itself was first established uh, by the settlement of Europeans in 1857, the attention of the settler families was not inland, it was exclusively towards the sea. All the families that settled in Hermanus Petersfontein in the 1850s and 1860s were oriented towards fishing. They were basically subsistence fisher people. Uh, the correct political term for fisher people these days is artisanal fishers. And they were much more focused on the fist buy and the subsistence of activity of fishing, which later, of course, became an industrial and economically viable activity. However, while they were focusing on the fist buy, their children were looking inland. He has an extract from the village of the sea by Ardu and Treadgold. In the spring, children find the lovely Caledon bluebells swinging on slender stems in the mountain breezes. Nearby will be the elegant pink painted lilies or tall yellow, sorry, painted ladies or tall, tall yellow aunt broom with their strong sweet evening fragrance. And one of the loveliest and most rarely scented of all flowers, the brown Africander. In the summer, children would gather bunches of red dyesers. Yes, bunches, for they had not yet been driven from their last refuge, waterfalls and other almost inaccessible parts of the mountain. Uh, Afrikaners, I understand, are not usually found here now, but I did find an image of the brown Afrikaner, which I thought I would share with you. The first person named in her minus to take a personal interest in Feinbos was William Hugh Patterson, later in his life known as Meester because of the huge volume of knowledge which he acquired uh, during his lifetime. We see him in the picture on the left with some of his teaching colleagues uh, he is the person in the center of the picture uh, with the teacup clearly visible in his hand. This group of teachers te taught at the Clip School, which had been built at the base of Hoyskopi uh, in around 1915 to 1918. 
and he was the first principal of the school and uh, the first real botanist to look closely at the area of the Ferncliffe Nature Reserve. However, he was not just an academic uh, botanist. He also took a keen interest in publicizing the existence of the Feinbos, uh, which were generally referred to in the 1920s as, I quote, wild flowers, unquote. The term Feinbos comes a considerable time after the 1920s. Uh, he promoted an understanding of the wildflowers and he was together with uh, the owner of the Marine Hotel, P. John Late, responsible for collecting specimens for the first ever Hermanus flower show. Uh, Mirsta, as you can see, a little older then, and this picture is dated 1923, uh, with a selection of the exhibits that featured in the first Hermanus flower show. However, Mr. Patterson was not satisfied with that level of publicity. And in the same year, 1923, he took a variety of flowers with him to the United Kingdom. He traveled there in order to visit the various monuments to men from Hermanus who had fallen in the First World War and to lay wild flowers on their monuments. He took a large quantity with him and at the beginning of his trip, he made a presentation to the then Queen, Queen Mary, uh, of a large bunch of wildflowers from Hermanus, which she is recorded as having graciously received and much admired. Uh, so by the 19, middle 1920s, the wildflowers were already well known in at least the major cities of the UK. And the activities of Patterson and Late continued into the 30s in publicizing and promoting attention to the Feinbos of Hermanus. Miesta also influenced two people who were very important later in promoting the Ferncliffe Nature Reserve. These were, of course, uh, General Jan Smuts, uh, later Prime Minister Smuts. As you can see, he was famous, or we might say notorious, for the attire that he, that he dressed in in order to botanize. Uh, generally speaking, uh, quite, uh, re quite unwilling to accept the conventions of dress required for botanizing in nature. However, he also uh, played a part in promoting flower shows and the growth of flowers and the knowledge of botany uh, all over South Africa. And here he is seen with his wife, Isa, generally known as the O Mrs, uh, inspecting what appeared to be a display of cannons in some location which is not recorded. In fact, in the 1960s, uh, Pitt Bjorkers, who was one of Smut's right-hand followers in the United Party, published a series of books about Smuts, one of which was devoted entirely to Smuts's interest in botany and his activities as a botanist. Uh, Björkes' daughter, Hani Richter, is a member of the History Society and until the end of this month, unfortunately, will reside in the house that Björkes built uh, in Westcliff Drive. She's moving to Cape Town on the, at the end of this month. The second person that Patterson influenced greatly was Her Royal Highness Princess Alice, Countess of Athlone. Her husband, the Earl of Athlone, was the Governor General of South Africa between 1924 and 1931, and she promoted a knowledge 
of uh, Fern Ferncliff and the wildflowers as vigorously as she could, both in South Africa and when she returned to London in, in England. This resulted in 1933 in a display of wildflowers originally in South Africa House. It was at the opening of South Africa House and later in the head office of the Royal Horticultural Society in London. Uh, this is a lengthy excerpt from a book of which I'm the editor and uh, deals with the fact that I, I only pick out uh, portions of the quote. Over 20,000 people visited the ex exhibition in 1933 and it got extensive coverage in the British media, uh, further promoting tourism to Hermanus uh, for the sake of its natural beauty. The In the 1920s and 1930s, literature about Hermanus is full of personal accounts of experiences with Feinbos. The best I've come across is that by Nancy Oakes, who towards the end of her life lived in Kilbrook, Kidbrook. She writes, from my vantage point, I could see that the Feinbos stretched from east to west, not a house in sight. The colors and the perfume were unforgettable. Amongst the proteas, lilies and reeds were little groups of women folk, all busily picking flowers for the show. The long-tailed sugarboard birds flicked from protea to protea, and it seemed as if the entire hillside lay in a mauve mist from the papies. I was handed a pair of scissors and told to fill three paraffines tins awash with water at my feet in the buggy. This was the pre-botanical era. The lady spoke knowledgeably of sugar bush and heath, of boba yankees and reeds, of arums and kalkunkis. Anything which bore a berry was a tolwasi. And there are numerous accounts in the literature of human interaction at very pleasurable levels uh, with Feinbos but not in the context of preservation of it or of protection of any of the species. In the 1930s, attempts were made to establish what would become the Hermanus Botanical Society. In, the 19, in 1930, precisely, Patterson and late started a horticultural and wildflower society, but there were deep internal divisions in the society regarding whether it was horticultural, i.e. oriented to gardening, or wildflower. And the society became dormant when Late died in 1940 and the, and the town entered the Second World War. After the Second World War, a man named Eric Jones, who features hugely in the history of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve, was appointed the Honorary Hermanus Park Curator, but his uh, area of responsibility was related to the parks in the town only, notably Swallow Park. In 1953, the municipality created a town beautifying committee. As you can see, their thoughts were a long way from preservation. But when in, 1950, in the same year, 1953, the dormant Horticultural and Wildflower Society and the committee had a meeting to merge, only 17 people attended and no action followed from it immediately. About that time, international trends were changing dramatically, probably best summed up by the appearance in 1960 of a book called Silent Spring, which, although it focused on the abuse of pesticides, made people understand that there was an environmental issue involved in the preservation of natural vegetation. And this had a major impact worldwide and in Hermanus. 
The Hermanus Botanical Society was established in 1960 and the history of the period 1960 to 1928, sorry, to 2020 uh, is preserved in a book uh, written by Deirdre Richards and published by the Botanical Society. I have tried to extract from that book the five key features why this, the present Botanical Society survived and prospered while others had gone defunct. First of all, there was this growing awareness internationally of conservation of natural vegetation. Secondly, the members of the society brought a sound intellectual base uh, to the preservation of Fanebush species. Thirdly, the organization was professionally structured and managed as a member-based organization. All of those involved had managed businesses and other enterprises in the past, and they knew what it took to make the organization manageable. And fourthly, and perhaps most importantly, they did not just establish the society and leave it as that. They came up with numbers of real, visible, practical projects in which the members could become involved. And in this way, built a membership ethos and an activity ethos, which has remained with the Botanical Society throughout its history. The highlights of the period 1960s to 2020s, as I say, is to be seen in the book by, by Deirdre Richards. I've just summarized them very briefly here by decade. In the decade of the 60s, a Rotary Way was established, tree planting took place at Mosul River, the cliff path was begun, new forms of flower shows were instituted, and the official opening took place. In the 70s, buildings, buildings were erected by the Botanical Society. Alien clearance was pursued relentlessly uh, to the great benefit of all of us who live now. The paths were built under the supervision of Iron Williams and the cliff path was completed to its original scope. In the 80s, the gardens were established by the Botanical Society in a portion of the reserve. The visitor center was built and the hall was built and other improvements took place. In the 90s, the Mosul River Trail was built. Hoy Skopi and the cliff path were incorporated into the reserve. And the first 20 years of this century, the cliff path management group was established in 2002. The Fonskoen Arboretum was established. The Hermanus Bypass Road came onto the agenda and towards the end of the period, so did the Ferncliff Management Plan. The Botanical Society established a research center and at the right at the end of the decade, the conservation agreement with the municipality was under discussion. The complete shift in approach of the new Botanical Society is summed up in this quotation from Williams. We thought we were going to turn Ferncliff into a beautiful garden. We knew nothing about conservation. I have here now a series of images of the very important figure, Eon Williams. He later completed his PhD, the first ever serious studies of leucodendrons, but he had plenty of time for pleasure activities. Here he is, the sailor on what appears to be the rather full Klein River Lagoon. He also walked extensively on the paths that he had helped himself to create. And he promoted the Botanical Society at many municipal functions. Here he is seen on the left uh, with his wife, Sheila, and on the right, Eric Jones, who worked clo closely with Williams in all these developments. Rotary Way was a great addition to the Hermanus, to the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. You see here a, a picture of the original kiosk 
later replaced by the visitor center. And the building established at the top of the mountain, the Gelpin Hut, named after Eric Gelpin, a well-known botanist and academic of that time. Here is an image of Mayor Francis Gonan opening the herbarium in 1983, uh, together with distinguished guests from Kirsten Bush and the Department of Nature Affairs. And here is a rather rare shot in color of the audience at the opening of the herbarium. Members of the Botanical Society may well recognize themselves in this picture. Flower shows and other activities went on unrelentingly during the last 20 years of the century and into the 21st century. Unfortunately, the present pandemic means that Feinbos for You uh, was the last flower festival that has been held in the reserve. We await further developments in that regard. In 2002, David Beatty established the Cliff Path Management Group, perhaps a personal entity here. Uh, he was going to call it the Cliff Path Management Committee. I told, said to him that committees achieve nothing, call it a group rather than a committee, and he did, and so CPMG came into existence. As many of you will know, the cliff path now of over 12 kilometers extends along the coast from the New Harbour to the Klein Rafia estuary, with many, many view sites along the way. This is a shot of a typical piece of the cliff path and near full clip taken last year before the epidemic clamped down on the use of the beaches. And the present chairperson of the Botanical Society, uh, Dr. Diane Maria, has had to deal with many of the difficulties arising from initiatives taken by other bodies and of course the impact of the pandemic itself on the nature reserve. I've reached some conclusions uh, which I will give over the picture of the Ferncliff Nature, of a portion of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve looking towards the three dams. First of all, it's now a vital part of the tourist economy of Hermanus. Secondly, the cliff path attracts tens of thousands of tourists each year. Uh, there is wide recognition of the botanical research done at the Botanical Society. But we enter the third decade of this century with certain threats and problems. Management structures are not appropriate to the Ferncliff Nature Reserve as it presently is. And above all, there is pressure on the reserve to generate income to, to set against the expenditure incurred in maintaining it. Now, organizations preserving natural assets all over the world have come under this pre financial pressure. And I'm sure that ways could be found to generate income from the Ferncliff Nature Reserve that would help to reduce its dependence on the municipality and to provide for further extension of our activity. I appeal to all of those who are watching this presentation to take a, a resolution this day that they will assist to the best of their ability and hopefully financially in maintaining what is probably the greatest natural asset of the Western Cape. My acknowledgements in drawing up this presentation are given on this slide. And thank you for listening. The complete text of what I have said can be obtained from me. If you send an email to me, I will send you in the form of a Word document everything I have said and some things I had to leave out during the time pressures. Thank you and over to you, Letitia, 
for the conclusion. That was most interesting. Uh, uh, there are a couple of comments, uh, but I don't think questions. But Phil, like me, noticed you walking away from us over the little bridge. Um, yes, he, he gets surprised. <laughs> that, that is a rear view of me. That's right, yes. <laughs> that was your Hitchcock moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Robin mm -hmm. and Deirdre are very happy to answer questions or uh, elaborate on anything you want to ask them. I'm happy to get the questions going, um, Letitia, and, and start, start some, some discussions. I mean, th many thanks to Robin for an excellent presentation and Deirdre and everyone else who has been involved and most of all to you know all the people over the years that have maintained and kept um, this amazing place going but but um, we, we all know that there, there are challenges out there and and we live in a changing world today I mean um, travel and tourism are under immense pressure and and maybe if I can ask Robin and Deirdre just and, and it's you know it's it's a it's a million dollar question. I mean, what thoughts and plans are going into the future of protecting and, and, and conserving this amazing place? You know, you've seen in our whole town and, and in the country without tourists, we, we're under immense pressure, you know, all sorts of businesses and tourist businesses under pressure. So what is the thought? How can we better um, you know, use and monetize, so to speak, um, this this resource. So that's my that's my starting point. Thank you, John. Uh, Deirdre, if you could unmute and uh, start your video, please, because I'm going to ask you to say a few things about the immediate prospects uh, for the Botanical Society as the most interested party in the Ferncliff Nature Reserve. Morning, um, yes, hi there. Um, I would have thought that, um, well, first of all, congratulations to Robin, which, who put the whole picture of Fernkloof together most beautifully and gave us an overall view of the whole thing. It is a problem. I don't quite know where we go to monetize our contribution because we have never been able to generate money other than to keep ourselves afloat. So I don't think we're going to be able to contribute much to the Hermanus Fiscus, but I would say that from our point of view, we can um, encourage a better knowledge of the fern kloof, uh, the beauty of the fern, of the famous of fern kloof, which I think is very undervalued and, and neglected and unknown. I think there are those more foreign visitors, if you like, who are appreciative of what we have and come to the visitor center and write wonderful comments in our little book. But um, I think maybe if I can refer to the research center, which has been established now for a little while, and we have this wonderful program on Thursday mornings, whereby um, we have various kind experts who um, open up the, um, the um, very powerful microscope and show us the insides, the um, design and beauty of the uh, Feinbos flowers themselves. And I think if we can publicize that to the wider public and invite the wider public to visit on a Thursday, that would be one small contribution we could make to, to publicize the, the reserve and its treasure. Thanks, Deirdre. Uh, John, if I could come on the monetizing issue. There's a lot of literature of organizations that have been stewards of natural assets and of how they set about raising funds in, in order to facilitate their work. Obviously, and one has to be innovative here, some fee for the use of the asset. And this can be generated in various ways. And I know that the openness of the nature reserve makes it difficult to impose a fee on people who walk there. But I'm sure, well, I feel sure that I can come up with innovative ways of doing that. Secondly, to set up a Friends of the Ferncliff Nature Reserve uh, body, which would actively raise funds for using, uh, for the preservation of the reserve. 
a systematic fund to build up endowments from international organizations concerned with nature conservation, uh, making donations preferably in sterling or dollars to an endowment fund, uh, either for the reserve as such or for the botanical society. And then a sensitive approach to wealthy individuals who, who live in the area to remember us in their wills and to contribute either to a separate fund where their legacy is preserved, perhaps the, the, Fernkloof, Nat the Fernkloof Natural Reserve Endowment Fund, uh, and uh, that th they could then contribute uh, significant uh, capital sums, which could then be invested and the income used to uh, take care of aspects of the reserve. So I feel quite sure that a fund generating program could be developed and that there's international expertise in this area that we could draw on to, to make a worthwhile monetary contribution in the future. Okay. Thank you for that, Robin. If I could just come back and add to that, I, I, I hear all that and, and I think they're all good ideas. It's been fascinating in lockdown to watch, I think it's 183 or 184, um, the, the, the TV programs on, on MNET. And, and, yeah, well, there's the safari, but but there's also another one. Yeah. But I mean, we forget that that many, many, uh, uh, okay, at Maryland just pointed out to me, it's BBC Earth 184, work on the wild side. And yeah. there are many overseas youngsters, uh, academics, um, interested parties who actually come to South Africa and work with conservation bodies in, in this country and actually pay, and, and I know it happens in some of the teaching hospitals too, they actually pay to come here to, to learn about conservation. And, and it occurs to me that Hermanus has amazing educational facilities. And, and when you look at the past um, research in, in, into the Feinbos and, and botanical research done in and around Fernclough, surely you know, that whole facility and the facilities are there need to be, and I'm not saying it's not been done, but better advertised, better marketed. You know, how can we attract other um, interested parties from other parts of the world, you know, to come and see a place like this, you know, obviously given the constraints of tourism and jumping on an aircraft. But it just occurs to me that, you know, Hermanus and all these facilities, we need to start thinking out the box. Even, even the work that has been done on rescuing or recovering the, um, the peat beds up the Himalanada Valley, I mean, that, that was real exceptional stuff, but very few people out there know about it. And, and so, uh, you know, we, we've also got to get our, our new and emerging population and black youngsters more familiar and, and interacting with this amazing um, fern, fern cliff environment that, that, that we have. I know, you know Wild Coast Conservation already do that, but it just strikes me we need to be doing a lot more uh, of, of, of what we can to market this facility and, and really spread its you know, fame and generate money from it worldwide. Thank you, John. Uh, 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 Robin and Deirdre, there are two questions that have come up. If you could just ask them. First of all, from uh, Milamin, when did the nursery, when was that added? And then uh, Pamela, who's asking, Roughly what amount of money is needed monthly? And then another question has come up. Is there any reason Fernkirf is not connected to the South African Botanical Society, like Harold Porter, Kirsten Moss, etc.? And uh, do those other gardens get funding from the government? So there are these three questions that have come up in the chat, chat box. If you could just address them quickly, please. Deirdre, do you have the date to, to hand of the nursery? Yes, I do. I can speak to the nursery. Even in the very beginning, um, as you stressed yourself, Robin, people were more interested really in gardening than they were in the um, preservation of Fainbos itself, but they realized the value and the beauty of the local plants. So they would grow in their own garden. They would grow slips of plants that were successful, and then they would swap them among each other, and then gradually they would come up to the, uh, the, the new area that the 
curator was working in just inside the gates where there was a big open area. It used to be an old quarry and they would bring their slips there and then they would swap. There was no money to uh, exchange place. And then in 1975, one of the Botanical Society members said that this actually needed to be more formalized and could be a little income stream for the society. And he started devoting his time unpaid initially to um, creating an, an area whereby he would collect the plants that people had grown on. And indeed he started in buying in um, other commercial plants that were local to the area. So he continued the same message. Thank you. I see that uh, the, the chairperson of the Botanical Society is with us. Uh, Di, would you like to speak to the question of botanical gardens and uh, raised, raised by Tom? Yes, certainly I can do that. Thank you, Robin, for a wonderful, wonderful address to us. It was just awesome to get that fantastic history and it's something we're going to cherish as a botanical society to have that, what you've said and, and those beautiful slides. But I can talk on the um, association of the Hermanus Botanic Society with the Botanic Society of South Africa. It has been looked at uh, a number of times in the past, including by myself. The Botanic Society of South Africa do not want to take on any more botanical gardens. They do not, and especially Fainbos uh, Botanical Gardens, they would rather take them from the Karoo areas or areas where they don't have many botanical gardens at pre present. What we are attempting to do at the moment is gain accreditation as a botanical garden from Botanical Garden Conservation International, which is an international body. It's the biggest body in the world, the biggest conservation body in the world. We will then get world recognition as an accredited botanical garden. It's quite a process. The, the municipality stopped me do, uh, going any further with it, but I have now got assurance from our mayor that I may continue with the accreditation, so I'm going to do that. We will then be on the world stage as a, a botanical garden, and there is plenty of funding for especially botanic gardens in the African, on the African continent. And I'm sure as a, an accredited botanical garden, uh, we will get be able to get funding from uh, world, you know, world sources. Um, and our research center, someone mentioned, we do want to, we've got a whole lot of projects we want to get going, but it's the pandemic didn't help. And of course, all these, these sort of things, we, we need money. But um, I'm sure once as an accredited botanical garden, we'll be able to apply for these funds. So I will be uh, spending my time this year um, hoping to attain accreditation at the Botanical Garden. We can then advertise and make a big hoo-ha about this Hermanus Botanical Garden. So that's where I will leave it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Di. Regarding uh, Pamela's question, roughly what amount of money is needed, uh, I can say that has not been quantified. We know, of course, what the municipality spends on the Ferncliff Nature Reserve and the Botanical Society and the Cliff Path Management Group uh, both have very well articulated budgets and expenditure plans. But I want to put it in the context of that the situation is one in which any amount of money, whether monthly, annually or by decades would help. It's not a question of, can we raise the amount needed? The question is, let us raise something and start the ball rolling of people thinking that this natural asset does not just conserve itself, unfortunately. The intrusion of human beings has subjected the uh, Feinbos, all areas of Feinbos to major pressure and uh, many of the expenditures are related to the preservation of Feinbos from human incursion. So uh, the answer is no, we don't know what monthly amount is needed, but any money will be extremely well used and very welcome. Thank you, Robin. Um, unless there are any more urgent questions, I think we should um, bring this to a conclusion now. Thank you very much. 
very interesting and you've all given us a job to do as well. It's inspiring and we've all got work to do uh, for the preservation of our environment and lots of lovely ideas that are, are coming from our participants and let's hope that we can once we get through this this uh, pandemic things could begin to move again but in the meantime just congratulations to the botanical society for what you do